might want to go back and get that guy and put him in jail. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Bessie Smith's uh, own life was one of those of many blues singers whose lives have sort of paralleled the songs, wasn't yes. it? Because her death particularly was very yes, tragic, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. Um, I was told that um, um, she, she had been in an automobile accident and um, they tried to take her to a hospital in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and they wouldn't allow blacks in there at that time, so she, they had to take her to Memphis, and I understand that she bled to mm. death. So she was a victim of segregation? Ah, yeah. uh, you might say that, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But she did, of course, uh, break into the white market in the sense that she was selling to, yes. to, to white people. Yes. I wonder if you were aware, as, as a young guy, of white people buying blues records? Not at that time, I was not. But uh, I knew that we liked Jimmy Rogers, so I didn't think in terms of a black-white thing then, because Jimmy Rogers, uh, to me, was just a great singer, and uh, I learned about him the same as I did about Blind Lemon and others through my art that bought the records. Yeah. So you're saying what we said previously, that you don't have to be black to sing the blues, no. it's possible to be white right. mm -hmm. to sing yes, the blues. Yes. And yet, before we move on to the next spot, which has got a lot of white blues singers, actually, um, I'm not... I'm sort of speaking against the white blues singers here, so don't feel you have to be polite. I mean, I've heard so many British blues singers, uh, oh, people like Mose Allison in the States. Yes. People who seem to me, fine, nice little records. Yes. Very pleasant sound, but superficial to me. So they, they're copying the surface of the blues and what it sounds like without paying the dues, and this something does not come through. <laughs> Well, John, I don't mean to be critical of you, so <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> but let me say it this way. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the critics, and, and especially the blues purists, they seem to think that if you have not worked in the cotton fields, if you have not pulled the corn or followed the mules or whatever, you can't um, do it very well. Now. I have to disagree somewhat because I had a young keyboard player from Boston named Ron Levy that played with me about four or five years that played as well as anybody I ever, ever had that played with me. But of course he said he learned his from a previous uh, uh, keyboard player named Otis Spann. But, we, but don't we all learn from somebody? Now I think what I'm leading up to is this. I say that uh, you don't have to be a sharecropper or one of those people to have had to experience all that, but it helps. Mm. Well, what we've got now is a medley of one or two people who are white, have had hard times, lived yeah. in the South. Perhaps that's what it's about. You know, to, to do the blues in, let's say, the South of England, to live in Brighton, England, and yes. suddenly wake up one morning and I shall play the blues. Perhaps that's what doesn't work, but to live in the South almost a sharecropper or a miner or whatever. Perhaps that same hard times we were talking but the about. Environment, That's the root. Yes, the environment, though, was felt by most people. Mm. Most people. That's what I meant, black and white. Yes, you know? it was felt yeah. by most people. Uh, I think, though, uh, the environment had a lot to do with but a whole lot of black and white that I've heard that didn't sing blues that I liked. Then you know, the other way they didn't sure. make my liver quiver, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it didn't necessarily have to be one, I think, though, that was born on the plantation. Well, let's, let's move on to another of our medleys, as I say, uh, white guys playing the All blues right. or, or, or trying to play the blues, okay. or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Mose Rager is, is the first one here who was, I think he was a, an associate of, of the father of the Everly brothers, uh, Ike Everly. Yes. And um, was an influence on uh, not only the Everly brothers themselves, but on Mill Travis. Well, us. Mill Travis, I knew. I did a film with him once up uh, in the hills of Kentucky. We did uh, a movie about the coal miners, and they was mm. talking about the blacks was brought over, a lot of the whites was brought, and all was brought to the mines to mine the, uh, you know, to get the coal out of there. Mm. And I, I thought it was a, a great artist. In fact, uh, he was one of the few country artists that I knew about as a kid. Yeah. Well, let's look at this uh, next medley, beginning with Mose Rago. Strangely enough, he's singing uh, backwater blues, okay. blues about the, the, the floods on the yes, Mississippi Delta, yes. which, of course, was recorded by Bessie Smith. Yes. Right and back Lonnie Johnson. Lead Belly right. and Lonnie Johnson right. and a lot of people. So this is the universal 
language of the blues. Would you believe I used to work on the levees there? I'm one of the, yes, I worked on the levees to help to keep it from flooding, that, what they're singing about. Yeah, well, this is going to be particularly <laughs> appropriate to you then, <laughs> Mose Rager. Yes. think of Mose Rager? I uh, liked him. He sang blues as well as anybody else I ever heard sing as a single. And it proves what I was talking about a few minutes ago, John. Mm -hmm. There are some people that can. <laughs> but do you think that was that sort of influence then that was the crucial wanting to rock and roll as much as black rhythm and blues? Oh yeah, of course. This guy was singing. If I didn't see him, I would never know he was white. Because mm -hmm. he didn't have that white sound that we usually uh, think that white people generally sound alike, or some black sound. European that way. sound, really. You know, the formal European sound. Uh, on yes, the... where every word is uh, precise. dignified and precise, you know, I should say dignified. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like uh, when he sing, he sing with that gospel feeling, that gospel soul. That was one of the things that Elvis Presley had that most people didn't pay much attention. He had that gospel soulful feeling. So. White country musicians growing up in the South have never been very far from the blues. In the early 30s, a young Texas fiddle player, Bob Wills, started mixing the musical cocktail that would be called Western Swing. It was blended from hoedown fiddling, Dixieland jazz, a little Mexican music, a dash of old country polka, and a lot of the blues. <laughs> never been very far from the blues. In the early 30s, a young Texas fiddle player, Bob Wills, started mixing the musical cocktail that would be called Western Swing. It was blended from hoedown fiddling, Dixieland jazz, a little Mexican music, a dash of old country polka, and a lot of the blues. <laughs> Yeah, you 
by the Western Swing Boys, the blues usually sounded chipper, or at least cheerfully resigned. But in the southeast, in the mountains of Appalachia, you could see its harder face. In the coal mines of Kentucky, the blues could still function as what Woody Guthrie called hard-hitting songs for hard-hit people. Nimrod Workman was a miner and union organizer in Kentucky for 42 years. He's retired now, but he still fights and writes songs for the thousands of miners afflicted with the occupational disease of like long. Went into my place this morning And I got down on my knees Couldn't load no coal All I could do was cough and weave Got that new McConio shirt, black one too. You got one, you got the other. Either way you lose. Well, I went to see my doctor, and he looked me over twice. You got something, Nimrod? Sure gonna take your life. Got that new McConio shirt. Black one, two, you get one, you got the other. Either way, I'm an old coal miner, and I've eat dust all my life. I'm too old to learn a new trade. What can I tell my wife? Got that new McCony old tree. Black long two, you get one, you got the other. So either way, you lose. 
got 13 little children, and they've all got to eat. No clothes upon their back, no shoes upon their feet. Got that new McCorney O'Shea, black on two. You get one, you got the other. So either way you lose. When I get up in heaven, St. Peter's gonna cry. When I tell him the reason, poor coal miner had to die. With that new McCorney O'Shea, black long two. You got one, you got the other. So either way you lose. When I get up in heaven, I'm gonna hug St. Peter's neck. When he tells old Paul and Charlie, write me his black lung check. Kill that new McCorney O'Shea, black lung two. Got one, you got the other. The White Blues tradition carries on from old-time singers like Nimrod Workman to the high lonesome bluegrass of Bill Monroe. From there it does a sidestep into the hothouse where a group of crazy scientists are cutting and grafting and growing the wildest musical hybrid of them all, rock and roll. Charlie Feathers was in at the beginning. He knew Elvis, even wrote a song for him. He knew Johnny Cash, he knew everybody. He hung around the Sun Record studio in Memphis watching and, he says, helping Sam Phillips to put it all together. Let me tell you about the uh, first hit Elvis Presley ever had. It, I think this song tells a story better than anything that, uh, that he ever did do. He had the big lips, you know, and he sang like color color. The old uh, blues stuff, I, I might demonstrate a little of it here. If, uh, if well, I used to up and down Mississippi, I'd see these nigger, I mean these colored people, you know. Uh, uh, a lot of people down there call them niggers, that's what they call them. And uh, they, the blue stuff, as I would say, they would chop this guitar, they'd get... Yeah, that one black red, from the I find you a trail. Blues that was down there, and uh, you take now Bill Monroe, he had a bluegrass tune that was uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky. Later was did by Elvis Presley, and it was a big hit. Bill Monroe at the time when Elvis came up there, really they didn't, they didn't want this cat on there doing that song that way. You could tell it. Everybody knew that. People loved it when they seen it, when they heard it. The bluegrass tune went something like this. Goodbye. Something of that sort. Nice that we just change around. This is more or less with a upright slap bass. Run through the reverb, the slap bass sound. Blue. And that's uh, when that music met the blues, old chop, and that's the way we turned it around. Oh, well, the head was on the moonlight night. 
Almost all of the southern rockabillies were steeped up in the blues, from the quiffs to the blue suede shoes. Elvis was, though he shook a lot of it off when he left Sun Records. Jerry Lee Lewis was too. It's one of the demons he tried to exercise by immersing himself in country music or religion. But he keeps coming back to it again, especially when he meets up with old renegade buddies like Carl Perkins.
examples of white, southern blues and, and, and rock and roll there. Let's move away from the south now, the, uh, geographically to the north, what I think of as the home of the blues, never having been there, <laughs> <laughs> to Chicago. What was so special then about this windy city on the edge of the lakes there, Chicago, right away from the Mississippi Delta? I mean, what was special about Chicago as a home for the blues? Well, uh, there were many places that the people...